Ever had to wake up at 3 a.m. to fix a critical data pipeline bug that could bring down an entire product feature? Yes, the not so glamorous side of working in Fang. We all see day in life kind of videos. In fact, I have a couple of them on my channel and we hear all about free food and free games and free massages. Yes, that's also a thing. Tons of stock options that you get, the brand name on your resume. So all the great things about working in Fang, right? But nobody seems to mention the harsh realities of working in Fang. Today, I'm going to pull back curtains on four major challenges that I also personally observed in working at a Fang and you can also face if you ever decide to join as a data engineer or to be honest in any technical role at these tech giants. I'm Josh and I'm a software engineer working in generative AI data products at DoDash and before that I was at Google for a couple of years and a couple of transformative years as well because I went in as a data engineer and quickly changed my ladder to being an AI engineer and it's been overall great so far. Google is a huge company it's divided into orgs like there are different orgs for ads, uh, YouTube, Android, Cloud and each org is so big that they can be its own independent company. I mean look at this data. YouTube ad itself alone brought in over 10 billion dollars of revenue. Google search brought in 54 billion last year. Google Cloud brought in about 12 billion dollars. And I worked within GCP, Google Cloud at Google, and it's the third largest cloud provider in the world after AWS and Azure. And within Google Cloud, I worked on a product called CC AI Insights, which is also known as Conversational AI Insight. It's about taking voice or text transcripts of conversation between a call center agent, for example, uh, and a customer, and then analyzing it, uh, doing some sort of topic model classification using LLM, also summarizing it and showing the final resolution rate automatically for QA operators so that they can analyze it better. Many GCP customers who have call centers in their organizations use this product. If you're interested to know more about this, then I'm going to add a link to this documentation that you're seeing in the description below. So now that you know my background, the point being everything I'll be sharing in this video will be from this perspective. But what I'll share won't only apply to FANG companies in general, but also to most of the big tech companies. But before we get started, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out a lot. Let's start with scale. When you talk about scale in FANG level of companies, it's like you're handling petabytes of data and tons of metrics and logs data or user interactions that come in every single second and any loss in the pipeline or loss in collecting data can snowball into having like lost millions of dollars in revenue or it can be a huge product failure. And as I mentioned earlier, I worked on a product called CCI Insights where we analyzed a lot of contact center calls or transcripts using AI and uh, there we handle like millions of calls and the voice transcripts were also usually in this range of 10 to 30 minutes. So we had huge data to deal with. Whenever something goes wrong, you have to spend a lot of time. You have to sift through endless logs and you have to like understand internal tool documentations a lot. And coming to internal tool documentations, most of these fan companies have a lot of developer productivity tools. These are internal tools that um, are specifically targeted so that you don't have to build something on your own and most of the time it's recommended that you use these tools instead of creating something completely from scratch for your platform. Uh, now the challenge with these tools is that there are just so many within uh, most of these big companies. For example, I worked on one of the tools, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm allowed to say its name in public, but that tool was like completely serverless and you can create workflows there you can create data pipelines you can write your sql no matter where your data is sitting is it on bigquery is it on spanner doesn't matter you can just write your sql and you can do orchestration and the same tool also allows you to look at the dashboard so with all of these tools the challenge that you face is you have to understand each and every tools documentation really thoroughly also if you don't know google uses a monorepo that means they only have one repository where all of Google's data is stored. Whether you talk about the animation that you get on your phone when you open YouTube or you talk about uh, billions of records sitting in your BigQuery and you're talking about analyzing them, all the features of all different organizations and within each organization, all different products sit on one repository. The way they handle it is obviously very impressive. Think about the sophistication of internal tools to handle this kind of monorepo because you need to ensure that there are no merge conflicts when people are working on completely two different folders on the repository because they can be working on two different organizations or two different products itself. These tools, they allow you to 
not just edit your code but merge it seamlessly and get reviews and undeploy your final code changes in in a way that uh, that's slowly deployed across the globe and the thing is most of these tools are not used outside of your own company so that's like a little bit of a drawback while you become really productive with these tools they also kind of make you handicapped because you cannot list uh, those exact tools in your resume because people outside don't even know what that is right while i get it they want you to focus on solving the problem the most optimal way and they, they don't want you to worry about infrastructure and everything or platform but at the same time wouldn't you be a better engineer if you learned everything from scratch like starting with authentication and logging and, and scaling that you usually don't have to worry about when you are working in these big tech you yes you do have to worry about how will you handle scale in the code that you write you need to ensure that there is no uh, bottleneck in terms of time complexity or everything uh, but apart from that when it comes to horizontal scaling vertical scaling things like that the these internal tools or platforms they take care of that more most of the time and one challenge that i saw was that documentation of these tools were also not complete all the time so uh, I mean, I get it, like mostly the features, the pace by which they release features is usually great. So uh, they don't have time to update documentation and they usually have separate team of technical writers who are responsible only for creating developer facing documents. In fact, I remember I was working on this product and uh, there was a technical writer in our team. She was based out of US. I used to create at least two feature requests in her name about every week to update the documentation. So if you are uh, seeing this video, I'm sorry for that, but it had to be done. Number two, competitive culture and a little bit of internal politics. The people who work at FANG are obviously one of the most performance driven people and either they are really smart or they are expert in their technical domains. Do you know that it's 26 times harder to get into Google versus to get into Harvard? I'm not kidding. I mean, if you look at this data, the acceptance rate of Google is about 0.2% versus Harvard stands at about 5.2%. And millions of people apply to companies like Google every year. And it's not just the case with Google. I mean, a lot of fan companies have very low acceptance rate, but Google comes out on top in that. And the performance review process, it kind of becomes very political because you have to show your impact the best way possible. You have to show the exact business outcomes that your feature made, how many, let's say, users increased, how many, what was the runtime that you decreased if it was an optimization feature. Did you collaborate with other people correctly? Did you demonstrate leadership when the time came? So you have to mention all of these things in your self-review or promo review packet. And the way you craft your self-review document can completely make or break how you grow in these organizations. So you have to spend a lot of time and energy on this. These promo packets are usually compared across your peers. For example, I think Google has about 6% of people, the bottom 6% have to be rated the lowest rating, right? So now if you are in an organization where it's doing really well, but they still have to find those bottom 6% of people, and it's not at all hard to avoid this bottom 6%, but I guess what's hard is to reach at the uh, topmost level of rating because you have a lot of profiles to compete with and documents are also very very important in these fan companies so you have to write a really good design document for every feature that you implement and i am in the favor of writing design documents don't get me wrong i understand why documents are really crucial but because now it's the necessity that everybody has to write good design documents a lot of people write it just for the sake of writing it, just to put it in their self-review or promo packet. But the document quality might not be that great. So it's not created from like an end user's perspective all the time. So in short, I would say competitiveness is like a double-edged sword. So it pushes you to excel, but at the same time, it can also be really intense if you are not prepared for it. Number three, bureaucratic process or lengthy approval processes. So most of the FANG companies, they are really huge in scale. So things kind of move slower versus in slower companies or startups, which is understandable, right? Even if it is a really groundbreaking innovation, the thing is any new line of code can be a risk because it's been used by millions if not billions of users so if you mess it up it can really hamper company's reputation so even if it's a small feature what happens is you have to go through a really lengthy approval process let's say you approve it with your manager and he gives a go ahead and he knows that yes this is a good feature that can really help but he wouldn't want to take the risk of approving this and you working on this individually so he might say that hey why don't you get uh, more signatures on this RFC doc before you start working on it. So you have to uh, go to the director or even sometimes VPs to get approval. So it's usually slow and I, I get the reason like I know that it's risky, 
but at the same time sometimes engineer inside you will be longing to write really good piece of code versus what you'll be stuck in is the lengthy approval process and the document refactoring on the flip side because of this aspect in my experience at least the work life balance in these tech giants are really good uh, and in my couple of years at google i never had any work life balance issues uh, Although it can change by depending on which org you are or which team you are in, because I know a lot of people at Amazon uh, who have really, really bad work-life balance. And last point, high stakes responsibilities and on-call stress. So on-call stress is not constant, uh, but if you are a data engineer, you need to understand that the true nature of this job itself is that you are a pipeline. I mean, you build pipeline, but then data engineers themselves are like a pipeline. A lot of software engineers who are not data engineers, they are like producers of data, right? They have to just send data to an API that data engineers have made, and then data engineers will have to deal with the scale of data and how they process it and how they transform it, right? How they make it useful for the analytics team. If you are somebody like a data scientist or a person who is in the analytical team, you are like a consumer. So you just have to wait for data to arrive after data engineers have done their process. Now, because as a data engineer, you're stuck in the middle. When something breaks in your pipeline, a lot of users and a lot of features might get hampered. And the dashboards of the ML models that is created by the data scientists or analysts are often used by the directors or VPs, essentially the leadership of the company or the product. So sometimes even if your availability drops from 99.8% to 99.4%, that's a big issue and you have to get on call to fix it. Now, the good thing is that on call schedule is usually rotated. So if you are in a team that has decent enough size, then probably you'll have to be on call for two to three weeks within a quarter, which is not bad. But during those two to three weeks, you will have to like work extra hard because there can be any alert that can come up at around 3 a.m., 2 a.m. at night and you might have to fix it as soon as possible. Now, of course, you have run books, you have escalation paths and everything, but the end of the day, the box stops with you, right? And ultimately you are responsible for making sure that it is fixed. So in conclusion, here's the thing. If you thrive on challenging work and if you can push through the political tough environments and you want to, you crave that buzz of solving data problems at a really, really large scale, all of these challenges are not really a problem. In fact, they can present an opportunity uh, a learning opportunity that you'll remember for the rest of your life. The personal growth, the financial growth that you get and the technical mastery that you get after working in this large scale companies is obviously really good. And personally, I'm really grateful that I went through this journey and it was a, an extremely rewarding path for me as well. But I just wanted to kind of say that go into it with your eyes open. That's why I wanted to share these harsh realities with you uh, because they are not generally advertised on the LinkedIn jobs or any job portal or, or in these day in life kind of videos. Uh, so I just wanted you guys to be aware about it. If you have any questions, comments or thoughts, feel free to talk about it in the comment section below. I'll try to respond to each and every one of you. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.